Hey y'all, good morning, and hope everybody is having a great Sunday. Welcome to uh, the live Q&A number eight. This morning we're going to be talking about my video on uh, the molding tool path where we molded the guitar fretboard, the simple guitar fretboard. Now I know that I, I have a feeling, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling there are going to be some intense questions. So I tried to get as prepared as I could. Um, first off, let me kind of go down the list over here and say hi to some folks. Uh, we got uh, Thomas Grimm in the house and Richard Polin. I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, John DeRuse, Dave Krause, Kevin Ells, Frankie C and C and Woodworking Channel, Big Bear Four by Forty Three, Terry Murphy. Good morning. Thanks for uh, jumping in. Hope y'all are having a good day. Alan Prince, Bath UK. We have the uh, the UK contingent signing in this morning. Um. Yeah, and Patrick's Workshop. Good morning, good morning. Y'all need to go over and check out Patrick's Workshop. He's doing some good stuff over there. Um, it's, a, it's a very fun channel. And uh, let's see, Steve from Harniel Media, Eloy, Rockin' Woodworks. Okay, uh, before I get into any questions, there is some... Um, you probably saw on the video where I threw a subtitle over the uh, video and said this is incorrect I'd clean it up in the uh, live stream and that was a mistake I made in uh, talking about how to do this in vCarve and a uh, pro and vCarve desktop when I said you'd have to 3d model it in some other kind of a program that's not strictly speaking true the point that um, the point that I was trying to get across was that when it comes to machining in the fret slots, there are some things to consider. And I'm going to go ahead and switch over to a screen share here. And hopefully that is sharing correctly. Um, and that is... This is a cross section of some fret wire, standard fret wire. And you have the tang that gets pressed or hammered down into that fret slot. And then, of course, the crown of the fret, and that's all you see. Well, when you look at a cross section of a piece of fret wire, this tang is only about 70 thousandths tall. So, you're cutting a fret slot that's about 23 thousandths wide. And if you look at some of these 23 thousandths inch bits, they have a cutting length of about 69 thousandths. So, right off the bat, it's not quite deep enough to cut the slot needed for this tang. Then when you compound this issue by uh, carving that radius, then try to machine a radius slot, you're still going to have to go back with a fret saw and cut that uh, fret slot just slightly deeper to be able to even get the fret wire down into the fret slot. And the point, so the point that I was trying to make was the, with using the molding tool path, there was no way to project that fret slot down onto that radius fretboard to be able to cut that fret slot. So that's the point that I was trying to make. You would need to find a bit that's cutting a 23 thousandths diameter slot. And for those of you who are on metric, we're talking about 
uh, just slightly larger than half a millimeter. We're looking at 0.58 millimeters. So you need to find a bit that would cut that tiny of a slot that had a cutting length of at least 75 thousandths, which would be, let's see, point inches, which would be uh, about 1.9 mil. And you're going to be very hard pressed to find a bit with that tiny of a cutting diameter that will cut that long, that has that long of a cutting depth. That was my main point right there. Now, you could model it in something else like Rhino, or if you know somebody who has a spire, they could model it for you, export it as an STL, and send it to you. But currently, there's no way to project those fret slots down onto something like that radius fretboard that was uh, modeled using the molding toolpath. That was the point that I was trying to make. I misspoke. I totally forgot the cutting length of those bits. And um, so I knew I needed to clean it up now. So you can radius that fretboard in uh, VCarve Pro and VCarve Desktop. You just don't uh, have any way of projecting that um, fret slot down onto that carving. Because... Technically, the molding tool, bat, tool path is not a 3D model. So there's no model there for it to project those slots down onto. And to be, to be honest, I'm one of those old guys who prefers... I mean, I say I cut it with a fret saw. That's, that's my fret saw. It's no big deal. Um, it's a El Cheapo... Harbor Freight Japanese flush cut saw the older style up until about three years ago just by chance uh, Harbor Freight used to sell these little Japanese flush cut saws the kerf on the blade was 23 thousands just by coincidence well about three years ago they changed supplier and the kerf is a little bit too big for fret wire now so you can find fret cutting saws at uh, Stuart McDonald or uh, LMI. There's plenty of places to find that thin kerf saw. So um, uh, Patrick's Workshop says, with such small bits needed for the frets, I see why doing them by hand is easier. It is. Um, there's a gentleman that I met a few years back, um, met online, that is, he's in Australia. And his name is John, and he runs a company called Labels Extreme. I found him through watching the videos of a luthier by the name of David Fletcher, who's also down in Australia. And these guys are both absolute artists when it comes to guitar building. And John... His channel is called Labels Extreme. I'm going to go ahead and screen share it up again. Um, here's his uh, YouTube channel. I have not put a link in the description. I will do that as soon as this video goes live. And this man is an absolute wizard when it comes to all things guitars and especially when it comes to inlays. And if I could make a recommendation to you, if you're interested in this kind of thing, it would be to start with this video right here, the fretboard inlay on El Negro Especial. He built a guitar, the body, he has a ebony top on that body and an ebony fretboard on the neck. And he did white mother of pearl inlays all over the body and the neck. And it's just a truly glorious piece. And he gets into how he does these inlays. And you're talking about he machines fret slots and everything on his CNC. But when you're talking about machining those fret slots, he 
he says in the video that when you're talking about cutting those fret slots, you're with that tiny, tiny bit, you're talking about feed rates in single digits. And I did the calculations on it, and it's right around four inches per minute. So you you have to go that slow to keep from snapping that bit off because they are delicate. And oh my gosh, <laughs> four inches a minute, you figure when you're doing something like what he did with that inlay, because he carved out all of the female with that little half male bit and then went back and cut out the mother of pearl, again, running anywhere from three to four inches per minute for feed rates. They take a lot of time. So, okay, Steve says he's got a split. Uh, thank you for checking in, Steve. I'll talk to you a bit later on. So let's see who else has joined us here. Uh, Mr. Dave Gatton, running the Gatton CNC so he can't hear. Well, you got a shout out, Dave. So uh, Frankie CNC work, Woodworking says, try the Harbor Freight Coping Saw. I have not tried the Harbor Freight Coping Saw. Like I said, I have this. And um, it's, you know, it's cheap. It's easy, much like myself. Um, what I did was I took, I took the standard, you know, Japanese flush cut saw. And you can see I drilled a couple holes here and run some screws through. This is a piece of an aluminum yardstick that I use as a depth stop. So I can cut those fret and it's not going to cut too deep. So um, I actually got the idea for V-carving those little fret markers from Dave Gatton and his cigar box guitar builds. He uses a V bit to just draw a line to indicate exactly where those fret slots go. And then much the same as me goes back with his fret saw and cuts those fret slots. The other thing I forgot to mention in the video is what I do. I will radius the fretboard, then come along and make those indications with the V bit. Then I take the material off the table put it in my fret slotting jig, cut the slots, then I reattach it to the table, reset my XYZ zero, then cut out the outside profile. So it is slotted before I cut it out. And I forgot to mention that in the video. So there's another mistake I had to clean up. So... Jim Hester in the house, Larry Blair, Mike Haichu... Boy, got everybody, all the people. Guillermo Alvarez, I hope I didn't just tear up your name, sir. Thank you for chiming in. Jim Hester, I forgot to set my alarm and just got here. I'll go back to the first 10 minutes later for what you said about the guitar site. I haven't said anything about the guitar site yet, but I did talk about um, my mistake that I made in the video that I was clearing up, and it's all about bit cutting length. So, Brian Dar Darmanin, I hope I'm not butchering that, from Malta. Holy cow, truly international. Man. Phew. So, um, now that I've got those cleared up, were there any questions on the molding toolpath, the fretboard, or any of that kind of thing? I know I opened up a huge can of worms. but uh, And guitar people are strange people people they are very very picky and if you get one thing wrong boy they are quick to jump so that's why i prefaced right up front i am not a luthier i am a hack guitar builder <laughs> and i know it i'm the first one to admit it but the people who have them they're happy with them david roby checking in are there any questions at all about the project or about the molding toolpath. I will be doing more videos on the molding toolpath because there are some things folks need to know about how it works. You can use a closed vector as a drive rail, but there are some things you have to uh, concern yourself with, some things you have to keep in mind. 
when you do. Uh, you can use more than one drive rail. I'll be doing videos on both of those subjects down the road. No questions at all. Everybody is up to speed and ready and raring to go. Okay, great. My work here is done then. <laughs> David Roby, how you doing? So, um, Alan Prince, I tried the molding tool path this afternoon. It worked a treat. I intend to cut all my fret slots by hand with my indexing fret jig. Yeah, that's, you know, it, it, it's funny. It all depends, I guess, on what your uh, priorities are because I just enjoy the process. So cutting fret slots, I mean, on that particular fretboard, we're talking 21 fret slots. It doesn't take that long. I mean, you put it in the jig, and the jig basically is nothing more than a miter box that I've cut in half and reassembled to, I don't have it right here handy or I dig it out. Maybe I'll do a video on making that miter box. It just holds the fret saw perpendicular to the inside edge of the jig. And... Um, I just put the fretboard down in it, hold it down, and saw the fret slot, move it forward to the next one, saw the fret slot. And um, it works real well, and I actually enjoy the process, so I don't mind cutting fret slots by hand. The main advantage to using a CNC to cut the fret slots is you can create blind fret slots, meaning, let me switch over here to Aspire and I'll show you, um, meaning that you can, zoom in here, you can end this fret slot somewhere in here, say about oh, 30 thousandths away from the edge of the fretboard, so that you don't see any fret slots from the edge. And then you have uh, a little tool called a tang nipper. You uh, put the, let me get back over here, you put the tang of the uh, fret wire in that tang nipper and it snips out a little section of it. So you can drive the fret into the fret slot and you don't see the edge. You don't see the cut. You don't see the edge of the fret wire. You can do that on a CNC. And it works out really, really, really nice. Uh, it's not 100% necessary. It's just one of those little details that uh, separates folks from the crowd. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Could the molding tool path work on the back of the necks? This is from... I am not even going to attempt to uh, pronounce that name. Looks like uh, J.R.M. Jim Mills. Okay. Um, the molding tool path could be made to work for the back of the neck. Uh, I'll have to do a little bit more exploring in that it could be uh, used for that um, again you'd have to look into depth of cut bit cutting length etc and you know give it a try you know uh, model up a piece and uh, in in V carve and try it and see if you can get a decent preview. And then I'll be honest, y'all, when I started building guitars a few years back, I went down to Home Depot and I grabbed a kiln-dried stud and I cut it into two-foot-long pieces and stuck, a, stuck each piece on the CNC one at a time and just experimented on cheap two-by-fours. You know, I figure it's better to cut up a $2 2x4 than it is to glue up a four-piece laminate neck and uh, then screw that up. So, you know, you practice until you get it right. I mean, heck, 
you should see the burn pile I've I did when I was learning how to do this stuff. Don't be afraid to experiment. I mean, a cheap piece of two by four, try carving the back. And if it works, okay, great. That's step one. You've got that. Then you can move on to the headstock or then move on to the heel. So, um, see, Alan Prince, would it be possible to do compound radius fretboards? Not with the molding tool path. For that, you'll need 3D modeling capability. And you can do a compound uh, radius in Aspire, but not in VCarve. But remember, VCarve isn't and never was meant to be a 3D modeling program. So, but uh, you can do that in Aspire. Let's see, Patrick's uh, workshop. I have a question. So what other applications could this molding toolpath be used for? Can it be used in sign making or making a radius on top of like a 12-inch donut? Yes and yes. Um, it will follow a closed vector. But again, there are some things to know and things to keep in mind on that. I am going to be doing a uh, video on using closed vectors. Probably won't be next week. It'll maybe be the week after. Um, and if you'd like, I'll, uh, I can uh, use a 12-inch donut as an example. So that would be, you know, fairly simple. The main thing to remember about using closed vectors for the molding toolpath is the toolpath will always project away from the vector. And you, when I showed in the video today, um, what I mean by that, project away from the vector to the outside. And in the video I showed today, you can right click and hit reverse direction. That doesn't work with a closed vector. It will only project outward away from the vector. So in the case of the 12-inch donut, you would select the inside vector, then use the molding tool path to project out away from it. You cannot turn it around on a uh, closed vector. So, well, sorry to see you go, Brian. This wasn't all about guitar builds, but, uh, you know, I, I just figured that would be an easy project to do. But thanks for stopping by and thanks for checking in. So, so, were there any other questions about the molding tool path or uh, the fretboard or guitar building or anything like that? So, I'll wait and let the uh, chat catch up while I take another sip of coffee. If you have a beverage, time for a break. Much better. So... Uh, let's see. I I think doing the donut would be a simple project, Patrick, so I, I'll probably use that as an example for, uh, for the next video on working with closed vectors. But yes, you can project like a, um, uh, a simple crown molding or even a complex crown molding around the inside of the, like the frame of a sign or a mirror frame or something to that effect. And the reason they came up with the molding tool path from the get-go was if you look at the difference between the way the molding tool path actually creates the, pa the, the passes that the bit is going to take, on a 3D tool path, you either you have your choice of doing it uh, raster or offset. An offset will go around in a circle. Raster will go back and forth. Well, if you have the um, if you have a curved piece of molding, for example, you're basically stuck with going raster if you're using a 3D model. The way the molding tool path does is it will actually follow that curve if you're doing like an arc in crown molding. It will actually follow that curve and machine that way. 
reducing the amount of sanding you have to do where your elevations change. So they created the molding tool path to kind of speed up the process for folks who were using it to make moldings. So, David Kraus, can you eject both ways off the vector? Uh, I'm not sure I'm following you. What do you mean by eject both ways? I, I'm not following that. Maybe you can clarify a little bit, and I'll wait for him to clarify. Let's see. What else are we looking at here? Any other questions? Um, no, nothing new. Just waiting for... Let's see. I also build acoustic guitars. This is from uh, Alan Prince. I also build acoustic guitars. Could the molding tool path be used to create a sanding dish? Yes. The only thing is you have to get all your measurements exact. You can... And remember, well, that might be a little bit difficult to do a sanding dish simply because on a closed vector, the um, molding tool path will only project outward away to the outside of the vector. Now, there are some folks who are... There are some folks who have learned to, quote-unquote, cheat the system. And what they'll do is, for instance, a circle for your sanding dish, they'll actually split that up into two arcs, where we have an arc going upwards and an arc going downwards. Then they'll use two separate molding tool paths to be able to project inwards from the outside edge, from that outside circle, inwards. So it'll actually be two separate tool paths and then a little sanding to kind of where they join, unless you do a small overlap. But um, I do know the folks at Vectric are working on a way to get the programming to work right so that you can project inwards into a closed vector, but they just haven't got it right yet. So, Jim Hester, thanks for the opportunity. Authorization for a beverage break. I needed it. Yes, sir. <laughs> it was nice to have the video be about a fretboard since I knew about the need to have a radius. Well, actually, radius fretboards are kind of an option. I mean, for years and years and years, pick up an acoustic guitar. Most of them have a flat fretboard. Um, not all of them, of course. But um, banjos, um, acoustic guitars, and even some electric guitars do have flat fretboards. So uh, the radius is more of a more recent, I mean, within the last hundred years or so. But uh, relatively speaking, there's nothing wrong with a flat fretboard. I mean, I've made, God, I've made several myself. But uh, a radius is, uh, again, another one of those little details that um, sets you apart from the rest, you know. Especially if you do a compound radius, you know, where you're starting up close to the nut with a, say, a 12-inch radius and you taper it down to a 16-inch radius at the heel where it gets wider, you know. Uh, not everybody does that. And that's one of those little custom touches. But guitar people, like I say, are very, very, very picky people. And it's, it's all down to the player. Some players, and that's why I was kind of hesitant talking about the um, uh, using the molding tool path for the back of the neck. Some players love a nice, fat, neck with a c-shaped um shape on the back of the neck some like a deep v some like a flatter d shape it's all down to the player and you can spend you know hours refining the shape on the back of a neck and get it absolutely perfect hand it to the player and they just don't like it because it doesn't feel right you know guitarists 
are are picky people, and rightly so. I mean, you know, you're talking about the tips of fingers and and uh, you know very sensitive parts of the body. You know, but people people don't forget people forget how sensitive fingertips are. I mean, when you think about it, you can place a human hair on a flat surface and feel that. You can feel the height of that human hair. I mean, just think about how tiny that is. So, and believe me, when I say in the video that there's still going to be some sanding involved, I take my fretboards, when I'm sanding a fretboard, at the absolute minimum, I go down to 2,000 grit sandpaper. More often than not, I go to 4,000 just to get it absolutely as smooth and silky as possible. So there will be sanding involved. It doesn't matter what bit you use and how tight your step over is. I mean, you're basically polishing the wood when you get down to your final sanding. So, I mean, some people stop at 800 and great, but uh, uh, everybody I've ever built a guitar for has wanted it little bit of extra added silky smooth and maybe I go overboard I don't know but I've never had a complaint <laughs> so uh, Alan Prince my acoustics have a 16 inch radius yeah um, there are a lot of acoustic builders that do radius of fretboard but I mean for centuries they flat fretboards were the standard so it's my my only point on that was that it, it it's more of a recent development and it's not strictly speaking 100 percent necessary so dave kraus i still um don't really understand your question can you eject both ways off of the vector i'm not really certain what you mean if you can clarify just a little bit before we start wrapping this up so i will go ahead and um, put a link to Labels Extreme, the YouTube channel, down in the description of this video as soon as it goes live. And I'll put another link to that video. It's, it's a long video. It's 33 minutes. But, I mean, he gets into the nuts and bolts of how he does his inlays. And this guy is an absolute artist when it comes to doing inlays. Um, I, I want to grow up to be just like him. John is the go-to man and he's a nice guy. He'll take your email. He'll answer your questions. He's just a good man and he knows what he's doing. Some of the stuff he's done, check out his Facebook page, uh, the labels extreme Facebook page and take a look at some of the work he's done. It's just absolutely glorious. I mean, one of my favorites he did was he did a truss rod cover, which if you know anything about truss rod covers, they're, oh, maybe an inch, inch and a half tall. They're not very big at all. But this was a portrait of Stevie Ray Vaughan playing the guitar, and the level of detail in this mother-of-pearl inlaid portrait was just, I mean, down to the tuners the tuning pegs on his guitar is just absolutely glorious. The guy's a wizard with this stuff. But I'll put a link to the uh, El Negro Especial video down in the description of this. It's really, really worth the time if you're thinking about getting into inlays of any type. So, Unrealized, signing in from Norway. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but you signed in just in time to miss me. I think I'm about ready to wrap this up. I didn't get any uh, uh, didn't get any clarification from uh, Dave Krause. Let's see, Thomas Graham. Perhaps Dave's mean. Dave means, can you cut profiles? on both sides of the vector and use different profiles. Oh, if you mean can you use one drive rail for two different profiles, yes you can. And that was going to be another video down the road. See, I have discovered that when I do a video uh, introducing a, a method or a technique and then I do a part two the very next week, people don't 
uh, really pay much attention to it. So by spacing them out and maybe doing one every other week, folks will get the message. Because you don't know how many times I have, um, like I did a three-part series on working with script text, uh, script style fonts, you know. And I introduced it in one video, then went part two and explained something further. You don't know how many times folks have seen part one and sent me a question that I answered in part two and they never bothered to watch it. So I'm going to kind of space the videos out a little bit. So Alan Prince, SRV, now we're talking. You bet. You bet. Greatest guitarist to ever finger a fret, in my opinion. In my opinion. Stay off me, Jimi Hendrix fans. I know. I know. I love Jimmy too. But. So, okay, on that bombshell and on that happy note, I think uh, we'll go ahead and uh, put an end to this one wrap it up and uh, just end it by saying I'd like to thank everybody very much for joining us today. Thank you for your questions, your comments. If you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the comment section or head over to my website and send me a, a email through the contact us page. I do read every single one of them. I try like crazy to get back to every single email I get. Sometimes it takes me a couple of days because I get a lot of emails. And uh, I do try to follow up and uh, answer every one. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to watch as always. And thanks for being there. So have a happy Sunday. Get out there and make some chips, and y'all take care.